Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the world's biggest stars, some of my favourite people, and a man I last saw nearly ten years ago. Jules Knight, how are you? I'm, I'm well. How are you? You don't look a day older, obviously. Um, and I'm... nor do you, actually, and that's quite frustrating. You see, the thing is, as a deeply unattractive man, when I know I'm interviewing someone like you, it becomes uncomfortable because everybody who walks past think that it's like some unfortunate internet date gone wrong. <laughs> well, that's what it does feel like, that. But it, it's, it, it is lovely to see you, and obviously we, I do have very strong feelings towards you, and I, I can't deny that. So it is nice to see you again. Yeah, so. Absolutely, and we are in a hotel, which makes it even more creepy. Well, it's it's very romantic. We're in this beautiful <laughs> hotel, with amazing architecture, beautiful lighting, and uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm very moved. Really. It's fascinating to see the trajectory of your career because, of course, since you spoke to me, it's all gone very, very well. Um, we did the first network interview, I think it was, for the BBC when you were in Blake, and that's the last time we spoke. Since then, um, you made the choice to go away and do your own thing, and it's really been the greatest thing of your career because Holby City has found you this entire new audience who have literally fallen in love with you. Well, that's very kind of you to say that. No, it's been great. Um, it's amazing how much has happened since I last spoke to you. Um, and, yeah, though I was in, obviously, the group called Blake, and uh, we were a vocal group, and did lots of gigs, and we did four albums over a period of about six years. And, and we did pretty well, and I, I loved it. I really enjoyed it. We travelled the world, got to do some amazing things, and got treated very well, and, and sort of got to behave like a rock star for a little bit, even though we were a classical boy band, so it wasn't that cool. Um, but yeah, uh, eventually after yeah, five and a half, six years, I decided to leave the group um, because I sort of felt like we had achieved all we were going to achieve, really. Um, and I said goodbye to the boys, and I was very, very lucky to get a job um, as Harry Tressler on Holby City. Um, and it was really great to, to be able to make the jump from, um, essentially, from a music career into an acting career. Um, I mean, I trained to be an actor before, so actually that was, that was my first ambition really to be an actor and the singing just sort of happened so I went with it but it, eventually I, I managed to, to get there and, and have done two really great years on Holby City and, and loved every minute of it um, and now I've left Holby obviously um, and uh, I'm, I'm doing a, a solo album so the, the solo album's out April 20th so it's a bit of a, a diversion from acting again. The Holby thing was interesting because it made you not only an entity in your own right, opposed to part of a boy band, it made you, um, well, a nice bit of trouser for the ladies. And when I Googled you today, all these pictures come up. Um, and it seems like you have fans from sort of 16 to 65. It's incredible what that show's done for you. Um, and to leave it now to do this album seems perfect timing because they'll all come with you, won't they? When you say you've been Googling me and you found pictures, what, what kind of pictures? I'm a bit worried. Well, you're right. A caveat to that was I was on the train prepping the interview, so it wasn't in the creepy sort of 2 a.m. slot or anything like that. Have you Googled yourself recently? I couldn't possibly comment. Of course I have. Yeah, yeah, uh, I have. And thankfully there are no naked photos there, so that's good. I'm, I'm winning on that front, although, you know, we never know what's going to happen in the future. Um, Ex-girlfriends could come out of the woodwork and stitch you up, so, um, you know, looking forward to that. But, no, um, yeah, uh, it's, been, it's been great, and it, it's been good to pick up a whole new set of fans um, and as you say the the age group and uh, of the of the fans is sort of widened a, li a little bit I think when we were in Blake we definitely uh, we were sort of popular with with lots of well frankly sort of middle-aged housewives which was absolutely lovely and and, and obviously appreciate that um, but yeah it's been interesting to see with Holby um, lots of younger people coming on board um, and when I look at my Twitter feed and there are lots of sort of young girls between the ages of 10 and 18 so that's been it's been good lots of new fans on board which is great and it's you know it, it's really good I think when you when you have a career which you can build a different fan base and uh, you know it's a, it's a sort of a, a slow process one of the questions I was going to ask you at the end is what are you are you a singer or an actor I'm guessing you've got to be a singer first haven't you because that's what you started doing well I guess I sometimes ask myself that question and I don't really know the answer. And I, I sort of don't really want to say I'm a singer or an actor. Um, I, I really am both. And I loved acting ever since I was about seven years old. And I used to stand in front of the TV um, pretending to be Basil Fawlty from Fawlty Towers and doing impressions of, of you know, Blackadder and, and all, all that kind of stuff. Okay, I have to interrupt now and ask you to do the impression, if you could, <laughs> of Basil Fawlty, if you wouldn't mind. Right, that's it. Fine. 
<laughs> that kind of thing. I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. No, I'll give you that. Alex, but... we're in a hotel. You know, there, there are people around here. Security it's, have been called. So people are looking at me funnily. Okay, <laughs> it's right. Um, no, it's um, yeah. So I, I suppose in a way, the first, my first love was was acting, really. And I used to love watching TV and comedy and films, and uh, and that's always been a passion of mine. So, um, but then of course, yeah, singing has been a huge part of my life. I was a chorister from the age of seven at Winchester Cathedral, um, and so I had a very kind of strict musical training from the age of seven to the age of about 18. Um, and singing has obviously, yeah, been a major thing in my life so far. Um, so it's both, really. What's that life like as a choir boy? It doesn't sound a great deal of fun. It sounds like an awful lot of discipline. Have I got that wrong? No, it's true. It was pretty strict. Um, I feel, um, I suppose I feel a little hard done by because... I feel like I was sort of working from a very young age and um, yeah, I was at boarding school and you know, not to kind of play the violin, but I did wake up at school on Christmas day for six years um, and all the other kids had gone home two weeks earlier and all the choristers had to stay on to sing all the services in the cathedral up until Christmas day and then on Christmas day I went home and I opened my stocking in the car on the way home, which is about two and a half hour drive. Um, so yeah, it it was pretty hard core um, but on the other hand we were very lucky you know I, I went to Brazil when I was nine and, and we toured South America and Australia and America by the time I was 12 um, so I had some amazing experiences and in a way I don't think Blake would have ever happened had had several of us had that kind of chorister background so it's been very important to me and um, I think it has set me up because it's given me a work ethic and it's given me a discipline um, which has stayed with me and I you know I'm ambitious and I, I like to work hard and I like to achieve stuff and I can kind of credit that to my sort of quite strict school experience really. We're both about the same age and I think at this point you start questioning your own parents' decisions and I have to ask you, would you do it to your child, put them in uh, a school where they had to be there and open their Christmas presents in the back of a car on Christmas Day? <laughs> well I think about this all the time to be honest. My sister's got three kids and they've been umming and ahhing about the whole thing and in the end they decided not to send the kids away um, and Max, who's 11, um, you know, he, he wasn't a chorister. And I, we've had lots of long discussions about it, and sometimes I am very pro kids being allowed to be kids and having more time to be young and play and do the things that kids really should be doing um, and maybe they shouldn't be at boarding school and they should be at home and developing a strong relationship with their parents but on the other hand I'm not entirely convinced that is that is right because I do think that what, what being a chorister for instance gives you is absolutely invaluable it does set you up for later on in life and I don't know did boarding school really harm me in any way not really you know, it sort of, I suppose it hardens you a bit, but you, it's sort of sink or swim and you, you get used to being independent. You get used to living without your parents. And I think it does make you a kind of quite a strong person. So I'm, I'm, I am torn because I can see the pros and cons of both. But I think at the end of the day, if I had the money, I probably actually would send my kids to, to be a chorister. It's interesting, isn't it? It's whether you look at the immediate picture or the bigger picture, and long term it's certainly paid off for you. Then again, how many kids who are in those schools end up with a career like yours? I suppose it's, it's balancing it out, isn't it? That's true. It's not to say that if you're a chorister you're going to end up you know, being an actor or a singer or anything. In fact, I think most most people don't. They go on to, to be lawyers and doctors and, and all of those kinds of things. But Why didn't you do that? You could be a millionaire by I, now. I think probably, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I probably could. I wish I was a doctor. You'd be wasting your time in dodgy hotels with me, would you? If I was a real doctor, I think I'd be earning a fortune. I read in the paper today that there was a locum doctor who got like three grand over Christmas for doing some shift. And I'm thinking, that is what I want to do. Now, in fact, actually, being on Holby City did make me think... I do really think that being a doctor is quite an amazing job and I've got a few friends who are doctors and uh, again they get paid quite well I, and they do work extremely hard uh, I think if you work in a hospital as a doctor it's pretty hardcore um, and the NHS isn't perfect but uh, what an amazing job and, and it must be incredibly satisfying to, to actually be a real doctor I'm just a fake pretend uh, doctor and, and maybe I only went into acting and singing because I'm not that 
I'm not that clever. You know, I'm, I'm not like academically brilliant at things like maths or science. I'm absolutely useless at science and maths and history and stuff. But I was sort of creative and I was good at English literature and drama and all that. So I suppose you just you end up normally doing what you're best at. Let's move on and talk about this new album because what's interesting about it is I've seen the reaction to it and your fans seem to like the fact that it's sort of um, a heartfelt album. It's not just thrown together with any old nonsense. You've really thought about each track and they all mean something to you, do they? Yeah, they do. And to be honest with you, having been in, in Holby for two years, um, I'm doing this album really because I... I want to enjoy the process and I love music and I, I felt like I had something good to, to give and I wanted to be a bit creative and not just put a whole bunch of songs that people have done a million times before and whack them together and, and you know that that would have been easy um, we've we have been creative with it we uh, there's a sort of we've, we've we work with the London Symphony Orchestra and there's a there's a little there's an overture and a reprise. So at the beginning of the album, you've got this very beautiful um, orchestral arrangement of um, Lullaby by Billy Joel. And then that bleeds into the first track, which is a... Uh, it starts off with me just singing a cappella, and then it's joined by some synths. And then at the end of the album, that, that theme comes back, and we hear the Billy Joel um, sort of orchestral reprise again. And all the songs are songs that mean something to me. They're, they're great songs, but songs that haven't been done to death. Because, again, I... I feel like what's the point in in just picking you know the, the the classic sort of you know songs that everyone's done and just doing them again in a way you know I think it's it's interesting to explore stuff that hasn't been done that often um, and I think we've done that on the album so there there are two or three sort of musical theatre esque tracks on the album um, because I wanted to sort of sing and and. Uh, you know, give it a bit of the old big voice stuff. Um, but again, there's a lot of light and shade. I, I, I sometimes listen to albums by incredibly good singers, and I feel like they're all a bit samey. I mean, technically they're brilliant, and, and you, you're very impressed by them. Um, and for the first two or three tracks, it's like, wow, this guy is amazing. But then they do, I, I do find that they can get a little bit. Uh, tedious because it's a bit like being whacked over the head you you know I, it's important I, it's important to have light and shade um, and having studied history of art at university I, I'm a big, big fan of that I think it's you know to have some sensitive stuff and some slow stuff and emotional stuff and to show a little bit of vulnerability in the voice I think is more interesting than just doing 10 massive tracks. It is. I was listening to an interview with Billy Joel actually the other day and it's interesting what you say about the classical stuff because he wishes he'd have been best known for that. He thinks the pop stuff is more or less rubbish and actually his classical writing, which Lullaby was, um, is his better stuff and it's interesting, isn't it, how as an artist you can't decide which market is going to take off for you and I suppose for you right now um, a natural step would probably be musical theatre is that something you'd want or have you got a direction you want to go in yeah well firstly we as again just going back to that idea of the album we we could have made a deeply sort of commercial album that we we had made purely just because we thought it was going to sell because people look on the back of the album they see the songs they know and they go oh great I'm going to buy this but we didn't really because frankly I'm not doing this for money um, I'm doing this because I want to make an album that I think is good and I think other people will, will think the same uh, it, it's not you know it, it's a sort of cerebral album in the fact that people have to maybe think a little bit it's not the most obvious album um, so I'm proud of, the, of what we've done with it and I didn't want to just sort of do, do the easy route um, and yeah, talking about musical theatre, um, I am really interested in doing musical theatre. Um, it's got to be the right part because I, my voice isn't suited to some of the stuff. Um, I haven't actually got like a really high tenor voice. Um, I've got a sort of light voice and it's sort of, as I say, it's got light and shade. But so some of the things that come on aren't really suitable um, because it's just not within my sort of vocal range. What about a giraffe in The Lion King, something like that? In the first few minutes of that, I, <laughs> I have to admit, I, ashamedly, I shed a tear um, when the animals came down. The, um, Don't give it away. Don't give it oh, away. Oh, sorry, sorry for it. Only one billion people have seen it so far. <laughs> yeah, no one's seen it. No, it's um, it's a great show. So no, I mean, I'm definitely interested, and there's so much great stuff being made. Um, there's a new show coming on soon called Kinky Boots, which apparently has been a massive success on, on Broadway. Um, so there's a lot of new new stuff being made, and every now and again there's a hit. So yeah, I'm I'm definitely interested. Maybe on Broadway, I'd like to go to America. 
Yeah, and that is a place where I think they'd appreciate you because your look, which I think people fell in love with through Holby more than through Blake because you had bigger exposure, um, certainly did you no harm. Um, that feeling of being attractive, something I've never felt. Um, oh, come, what, come now. What is that like when the phone rings and agents want you to do shoots for this and magazines for that? Because let's face it, you know, the likes of me and Michael Ball aren't getting those. <laughs> I love Michael Ball. No, I love him too, but you take my point. Um, yeah, well, I suppose um, it's very flattering that people th sort of say, oh, you're, you're the heartthrob and, you know, people have come I up with... I think Dr. Love is how they phrased <laughs> you in the uh, Holby City, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, Dr. Love, which is slightly embarrassing. Inappropriate. Actually. Yeah, slightly inappropriate. <laughs> no, it, it, it's lovely, but, you know, you can't take it too seriously. <laughs> Frankly, I'm not David Gandhi. Um, I look all right, but I'm not a model. Um, and... I suppose there's always the danger that people, you know, you don't really like the idea that you're being hired just because you look all right, do you know what I mean? And I think any critics out there would say, oh, he's only, he only got the job because, he, you know, he's a nice-looking bloke or whatever. So I, I would hate that to be the case because I feel like, you know, there's so much more to life than, you know, that, and looks are really not everything at all. Um, so I, I'd like to be respected as a singer as, and as an actor for being good at those things rather than just some, you know, bloke who looks good. I think you'd be gone by now, wouldn't you? You couldn't pull it off for this long. I mean, to have a longevity in a career can't just be about the aesthetics. People get bored with that within five minutes. Yeah, I guess they do. So I'm, I'm sort of hoping that I have some talent there somewhere. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's always that slight insecurity. You're thinking, oh, God, I hope I'm not getting this job just because they think oh, I'm in, you know, the eye candy or whatever. And you do get the odd comment on Twitter and there's the odd sort of negative uh, negative connotation like that and I don't know, you just roll with the punches I think if that's the most negative thing people are saying about you on Twitter, you're doing pretty well to be perfectly honest. Yeah, I can't really complain No, can I, I no. wouldn't worry about that. So the album's going to be out when and what's the project the new way of people and artists like yourselves um, getting an album made is through the fans, it's as simple as that record companies are not investing like they used to in fact there aren't any record companies left to invest, um, so your fans Fans have literally made this possible. Is that right? Yeah, pledges. Pledge Music is a is a website. I guess it's been going a few years now, but um, people are starting to learn about it. And it is. I think it's quite a good way of of doing it nowadays because it does connect you to the people who are actually buying the album and I've always sort of said there's this big there's, there's this sort of disconnect normally if you're with a major label you have this big marketing budget you have TV ads you make an album you don't have much creative control and you you basically whack it on TV you do all the TV interviews and performances and radio stuff and you hope that the fans are going to go oh who are these guys or who's this guy and, and they're going to buy the product um, Pledge is a little bit different Pledge is a bit like, it's a sort of modern day way of becoming more connected with the fans and so you you basically allow people who pledge behind the scenes access so you um, you do lots of video diaries you do updates you post photos of the album making process from the how beginning. much access do they actually get well it depends how much they pay Alex <laughs> they, they get to be a little bit more connected to you and, and they feel closer to the whole process they feel like they're actually um, learning about how you make an album and they're, they're sort of hearing about your feelings and emotions during that whole process and it is a bit you know, it can be a bit of a roller coaster of emotions because it's quite a stressful thing making an album. And do you mind giving that much of yourself? Um, I don't mind so much. I mean, I think it is a nice way of giving the fans a, a glimpse of the reality of, of what it takes to make an album and how it's not always, you know, easy. I mean, for instance, I was ill for three and a half weeks in the middle of making this album. And it was stressful, and I was a bit down, and I was a bit pissed off, and it was it was tricky. So I, you know, I, the few of my updates were like, "Wow, this is you know, this is pretty unfortunate." And I'm making an album, and I'm you know, the time's ticking, and money is being spent, and it was stressful. And I suppose I hope that that allowed the fans to sort of see a glimpse of the real me and and get to know me a little bit better. Um, and of course, it does you know, it works for for the artist because in return for this access the fans are pledging for things like let's say afternoon tea or you know personal training session or whatever and that in turn the money that they're paying for that is in turn helping to fund the album making process so you know i think it's a sort of give and take thing and it works both ways
So when you don't sound like you in the morning and you've got a concert or you've got to go into the studio and record something, what do you do? I imagine that's the most terrifying thing in the world, that your throat's not there, the voice is gone, and you've still got to do it. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it was it was bad enough when I was in Blake and there were three other guys um, uh, who, in a way, they can sort of cover in a concert situation. If, if one person's feeling a bit dodgy, you, you know, you're going to be OK. You can, there, are, there are various ways of covering that with, with three other vocals. But as a solo artist, I've already noticed that the pressure is much higher. Um, it's just you, if you have a bad voice, you know, I had sinusitis. I had this cold and it turned into sinusitis and I realised I tried singing and I was like, oh God, it sounds terrible because of course, you know, your sinuses are where you, you make a lot of the sound when you're singing. And I was thinking, what, what the hell am I going to do? I mean, it's just me and money is being spent and studio time is being booked and musicians are being booked. And so, you know, it is, it is tricky. And I, I now understand why artists take out big insurance when they do concerts and when they do tours, because if you're ill, there's actually nothing you can do about it. If you can't sing, you can't sing. And sometimes singing makes it even worse. So you just literally have to stop and you have to rest. So, uh, yeah, I have noticed there's a, there's a, a big difference in the sort of in the pressure stakes. Um, and as to whether I'll go on to do live gigs, I, I'm not sure really. It depends if, if people buy the album. If they buy the album, then there's obviously a market for it and we'll go out there and we'll, we'll do some gigs. And if they don't, then I'll go and do something else. <laughs> Listen, it's always nice seeing you and we wish you all the best. So the new album, let's do the big plug then, is called Change of Heart. It's going to be out when? April 20th um, and should be, it's definitely on Amazon. Um, you can get it on the website pledgemusic.com forward slash Jules Knight. Um, and I think it, it'll be in HMV and a few other places as well. This album is for people who love music. Um, it, there is quite a lot of uh, variation on it. It's a, it's a sort of journey through musical genres. And so if you like musical theatre, there are two or three tracks that will definitely appeal to you. And if you like stuff like Billy Joel, Peter Gabriel, um, and you know that kind of soft poppy type vibe then, then there's some of that there as well so I think if you like music and you have an open mind and you like singing then you should like the album For you is this the dream now? I mean you've obviously made it with Blake in the boy band that was the success for what it was four albums top of the charts and then a whole big well it doesn't get much bigger than that um, for the huge demographic of people I mean it's not bad at 33 to have achieved what you have is it terrifying to think you've probably got that again in your career to go because you can't stop now can you? No, I mean, I, I feel like I've done pretty well and I'm very thankful for all the opportunities that I've had. Um, and it's great to also have been able to do not just one thing, not just singing, but also to, to be doing acting as well. And not everyone gets the opportunity to do that. So I'm very thankful for that. But, you know, I look at, I, I look at people like Eddie Redmayne and he's younger than me and he's just won an Oscar. So I haven't done that well. You know, there's always, there's always more to go. And I think as long as you enjoy the process... And as long as you're, you know, passionate about what you do and, you know, you feel like you're doing the right job and you're not doing it because of money or you're not doing it for the wrong reasons, then it's all good. So I'm, I'm just going to carry on trying to have fun and trying to do the best that I can. Good luck with everything. I think it's going to be a huge year for you. Your brand new album is uh, available now on Amazon. Change of Heart is the album. Jules Knight, good to talk to you. Really great to see you. Thanks a lot.